On January 25th, 2018, Small Town Monsters launched their Kickstarter to fund three of their projects, including a documentary about the Flatwoods Monster of West Virginia folklore. I supported the Kickstarter and got my name in the credits of the film, along with other Kickstarter rewards. In the meantime, on February 9th, 2018, I went to the West Virginia State Capitol. I looked around at the building and the statues located on the outside, as well as going to the West Virginia Heritage Museum. What other state gift shop has a paranormal book section? Right there in the same building as West Virginia State Archive was John Keel's The Moth and Prophecy sitting on a shelf. Eventually the date arrived for the Flatwoods Monster documentary to debut on the big screen. On April 7, 2018, I returned to Braxton County, West Virginia to attend a screening of the film near Flatwoods and I explored the area once more. I got to see all the monster chairs in the newly opened Flatwoods Monster Museum. I ate at the local restaurant called The Spot which decorates itself with Flatwoods merchandise and ended it all off with a major event, a film and presentation about this legendary piece of West Virginia history and a night of small town monsters. Um, would you say that in the, in the 70s, the, the Flatwoods Monster was at all popular, like when you made the lanterns, um, the popularity of the legend of that time, what was it like? Well, it had kind of dwindled down. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, in the 50s, you know, whenever it happened, everybody was all excited about it. <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean to brag or anything, but we kind of created the enthusiasm uh, by creating the lantern. Mm -hmm. or originally it had a war bale in it and a lid that went in the bottom and you could actually put a candle in it and people you know would carry them around and stuff like that and you know that didn't catch on so we dropped the bale and, and they just made a, a figurine out of it. But, uh, like I said uh, in the Q&A, uh, in the 70s I got involved with the Chamber of Commerce and then we needed a profit maker and so we started making the monsters and that, that kind of created the enthusiasm again and we made like 300 and sold them and then it kind of died down again until about 1985 or 90 and this lady called me from the Gray Barker Museum and she wanted one and I went up there and I had like eight or ten left and I gave her one and there was so much interest there at the museum that I decided well you know maybe I ought to do this again so I got the molds and started making them again and that, that's how okay. so it's kind of been a Reperpetuation type thing. Yeah, so the in the 80s that museum kind of revived the interest and then Well, I lived in Summersville at that time. I went there in 86. So it was sometime Probably early 90s when I started redoing it. Up until then I just had the old version. I had a few of the old originals and If you ever get all of the original well, you want to really hold on to it because they're worth about a hundred bucks a piece <laughs> But there were 300 originals made. They said number one on the back. They said number one. And they're a little darker color. 
Well, so you, anything so, else? Oh, yeah, I was just I was just wanting to know about the the popularity of the the monster over time. You say that uh, your lantern helped in the 70s, and then there was more in the 80s, and then the modern popularity. Well, I, I really would like to take credit for keeping it alive mm -hmm. because I think without the lantern, uh, you know, it, it would have just died. Yeah, it would just been like a lot of folklore. But, you know, the, a lot of people bought the lanterns and they, you know, people say, well, what's that? You know, mm -hmm. what's that? And then yeah. the story gets told again, see? Mm -hmm. uh, it was the lantern, the first piece of merchandise oh, about yeah. the monster. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And there wasn't much. Now, this picture right here yeah. for the television station mm -hmm. back years ago. Yeah. She, she, that was on national television. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and this story, you know, and this picture is kind of... <laughs> You know, it's older than anything else because yeah. that's what that's what we created the monster lantern from is this this picture right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The original picture. There hasn't been much until recently, would you say? The the you know, like the stuff they sell, like the Well whenever when we started in the last since Andrew got here. Um, when Andrew down at the Monster Museum got involved, mm -hmm. then he did a lot of other things with the uh, with, uh, Monster memorabilia. Yeah. You know, we we had, uh, he's, he's got, if, have you been to the museum? Yes, I have. Okay. Well, you know, he's got all kind of little monsters. Mm -hmm. Some of them are made out of plastic or, you know, some of them ceramic. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know that 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 come later. That was mm -hmm. probably in the last three or four years. Oh, wow! So it's that recent? Maybe the last five years has okay. really grown a, a lot. Uh, before that, it was just the land. Yeah. So that that's really up cool. until up until I'd say. Sure. Okay. 2010. It was just the land. Okay. And after 2000, about 2010, I uh, got to seeing some other little monsters on the internet and stuff like that. Yeah. And a lot of people ask me why didn't I copyright it? And, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I just never did do it. <laughs> okay. So that's cool. So uh, I just wanted to thank you for okay. making the land and help keeping the folklore alive. Okay. Yep, so, You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. I have one more question though. Okay. Would you say the lantern is accurate to what the witnesses described? Like the the depiction of the lantern is accurate to as every... accurate as we could make it. Okay. Uh, if if you look at this picture, yeah. This was a drawing that yeah. they come up with. Mm, the fairly close. May come up with. Yep. And we use this drawing mm -hmm. to come up with the lantern. Yep. So okay. It's, it's as accurate as we could make it. Okay. You know. Um, and you heard what Mr. May said, mm -hmm. you know. He, he told the same story, red, green, and, and some black, maybe. Yeah. You know, we just chose to make it red and green. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that was because I always wanted to be a friendly monster. <laughs> yeah. And you know, if you use black, then it's scary and, and spooky looking. And you know, I just think it's, I think it's a friendly monster. Okay. Cool. <laughs> and now it's appropriate for all seasons. You got Halloween, nice. Red yeah. Christmas. Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay. Thanks again. Not only did the museum have Flatwoods Monster merchandise, but it also had an amazing historical artifact from the legend itself. Pieces of the actual tree the Flatwoods Monster was said to be seen near, all those decades ago, on September 12, 1952. One interesting thing about the Flatwoods Monster folklore is its popularity in Japan. Several video games were released in the 1980s and 90s featuring depictions of the iconic form. Japanese toys were also made inspired by the monstrous image. The Flatwoods Monster's design even appears in Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask on Nintendo 64.
We went on a scavenger hunt to find all the Flatwoods Monster chairs, driving from spot to spot to see each uniquely painted design and location. Are you going to do more practical effects like you did in some yes. of the... Um, so, uh, the, on Bray Road Beast, it's all, I think the plan is to make it all practical effects. We actually, as of right now, I'm not sure about this, but I don't think Chris Scout is back for Bray Road Beast. So Santino is doing some really cool stop motion paper puppet stuff, oh, cool. but we are, that is more going to be more about the lore, mm -hmm. like werewolf lore, and the the costume, all the werewolf stuff is going to be costume. We, we hired a guy to do costumes. Okay. Uh, it's sitting beside a utility garage, right in the spot we filmed it. It sits, it's sitting in mud. And it, it was, we put it on a track, like just the white and it fell off the track. That's why you only actually see the thing move once in the movie. Yeah. It fell off the track after we shot the one movement. <laughs> um, so it's sitting kind of in the mud. The biggest fear is actually that it's going to fall over backwards because it's, to it's top heavy. It's the top half probably weighs 350 pounds and the bottom half is only probably 150. At some point, you guys are going to do something with it, put it somewhere? My brother-in-law wants to. Move, he wanted to bring it here for this. Not that cool. He to move it. It's 13 feet tall, 500 pounds. So moving is extremely difficult. So he wasn't able. To move. Um, hmm. He plans on putting it in his front yard at some point. What's really funny about it is the is it is legitimately terrifying. Like uh -huh. if you if you walk up on that thing at night, it's it's huge. Yeah, that was my favorite part of the movie. Is that practical effect where you're showing that the yeah. the eye like portholes going yeah. through. Those that was are really flashlights. Cool. Those are little LED <laughs> flashlights in the eyes. Yeah, All we did is cool. because we were shooting fog, the fog machine, um, it just gives it a cool, like, it makes it look like they're these really powerful lights, but they weren't at all. Cool. So is he going to help you do more uh, kind of stuff like that for your movies? Well, that's my, my brother-in-law uh, works with metal and stuff, so uh -huh. it made sense for that monster. But okay, he couldn't I, build a UFO? Okay. At some point, he's built a UFO. Ah, before, cool. So at some point, I should try to get him to do that again. Okay. I wish I had, if I hadn't thought of, we didn't do that practical effect until way late in the game. Mm -hmm. He he built, he started building that in December. Like that's how mm -hmm. recent. And it took him months. Uh, will you do any films on investigators, like specifically on them? Um, on the trail of Champ mm -hmm. and on the trail of Bigfoot will be as much about the investigators. Invasion on Chestnut Ridge is as much about the investigators. In fact, there's no, the only witness in that entire movie is John Hayes. Everyone else yeah. is investigator. Yeah, I like, the, I like those, but I also kind of meant like um, biographies of like, oh, of like uh, people like John Keel. So I want to do a movie about Lauren Coleman, mm -hmm. like a biography about Lauren Coleman, kind of like a biopic. I don't know if it'll happen, but I have ideas for it. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. I like his work from the 70s. That's on my favorite. On the Trail of Bigfoot, which I'm working on, is going to be, uh, it's going to have a lot of, uh, on the Trail of Bigfoot, we'll have a lot of that background on whatever the guys, those Bigfoot guys. Yeah, I curved as well, just. Los Bigfoot guys. <laughs> So, would you ever do a documentary about John Keel or anything like that? John Keel, no. I don't have John, any plans right now. John okay, because um, at we some point it wouldn't surprise me if I tried yeah. to. Okay, because he's my favorite investigator. I'd love I to see like a documentary on that. Um, uh, John Keel, Jacques Vallée, Ivan Sanderson, those are some of the uh, investigators I'd love to see documentaries on. He, Ivan C. Sanderson was in this film a little yeah. bit. That was pretty cool. I like that. What do you think about Sanderson, though? If I can talk to him. Uh, to me, a lot of the information that Sanderson and Barker put out about the yeah. monster case is wrong. Well, Barker definitely, but I don't know about that, that much well, into Sanderson. See, my, what I was wondering is if, uh, is if because of Sanderson's I, I involvement with Barker said, on the case. Yeah, con contamination that way, okay. probably. See more questions. Uh, how do you deal with? Uh, how do you address outright hoaxes? We ever do that in a film? Um, how do you handle that kind of thing? I think you've seen how I handled it in Mothman and that when I talked about. When we talk about Gray Barker, he's a science fiction writer. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, 
I don't want to get into the business of like yeah like blasting someone in a film yeah okay. but uh, at the same time I don't feel like I should just ignore it entirely so I kind of like try to discreetly yeah try to be objective and stuff yeah. Okay, what about when a witness, you think a witness is fabricating, what do you do then? We've dealt with that. Or what, what can you do in that um, situation? It just depends. So we've, we've had people who I know are, are liars approach us about trying to be involved in a movie, mm -hmm. and we just sort of ignore them. Okay. But I mean, at the same time, you got to be... I asked Lyle, one of the first questions I ever asked Lyle was about that, because we <laughs> interviewed a guy in Beast of Whitehall who told us a story that we could in no way verify that had never been out there before. Mm -hmm. But it was a big story and, it, and if it is true, it does have an impact on the story. So when we put it in the film, I think there's narration that basically just says like, it sets it up as like, this is unverifiable. We have not been able to verify that any of this is true, but it needs to be, it needs to be documented because of the fact that it would be okay. what if, story, if it's true. Okay, what about stuff that's like been already exposed as hoax and is known as that? Would you like uh, be able to do a film telling the story and then like how uh, it came to be? Yeah, I definitely would do that. Um, like, didn't you say the Monroe thing was Monroe like? Monroe was a straight up hoax. Yeah, so could you ever do a film telling like that story and Monroe's how it happened? Monroe's going to be part of On the Trail of Bigfoot, so we're definitely going to do it. I, I think there's going to be an entire episode about hoaxes, Bigfoot hoaxes. Okay, cool. So that answers my question then. Other ideas, MIB documentary, Men in Black. Yeah, I would love to. Okay, because I thought maybe you guys would just add that into the, the different monster stories as they were there. Something like that would have fit in case files if I had the time to do it. Yeah, okay, so you think you could do a full one on just that? At some point, if I could find a story that... See, the thing is, it's uh, SDM needs to be able to function as, as a production company and uh -huh. as, a, as this sort of like regular series about small towns and their local lore. So we're trying to do, we're trying to get to a point where we can tell those stories, but we can also tell stories that have nothing to do with small towns. Yeah. So you might do uh, an MIB. I'd uh, love doctor. To. Okay, cool. I'm wouldn't that be I might. I'm saying I might. wouldn't that be like confusing to the audience when it's like, okay, here's a monster, and then after the monster sighting, these guys show up, and it's like they don't know the story of that monster. You know what I mean? Like you kind of have to go in, introduce it as you go through the monster stories, or like that'd be a difficult thing to do, right? Try to tell the story of a. Yeah, but you could do a movie that was solely about because that's a phenomenon mm -hmm. unto itself. It doesn't yeah. have to involve monsters. That's what I mean. It's like, yeah, so separated then. Yeah, it would have to exist. That story would have to exist outside of the regular series. Oh, okay. Um, one, how do you get uh, investigators to be in your film like Dave Spinks? Um, like, do you like some, how do you choose some people? Some people are very easy to get involved with. Okay, how do you choose what investigators you want to put in your film though? You just go up to somebody and say, this guy lives in the area, that sort of thing? They're intricate to either, either, either from the community or they're intricately tied to the case. We've never interviewed uh, an investigator who wasn't intricately involved in a case or from the community. So okay. like Dave's from the area. So. Yeah, so I couldn't be in your documentaries then unless I was like tied to the story. I'm off at Point Pleasant Part 2, I'll look you up. Okay, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Okay, the last one then. Are you going to be doing more stuff in West Virginia? Like, um, I'm going to be shooting an episode of On the Trail of Big Four. Okay, will you, will you guys be back in the state to show things other yeah, than... Yeah, we're going to be opening, we're kicking off the Mothman Festival. I'll be there every year. Okay. It is absolutely the best event we do. Okay, yes. I wanted to I thank you for everything that you've done for West Virginia folklore. So, and West Virginia history. High fives. You're awesome, man. Yeah, thank you. You hear me? Okay, cool. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Smith. Uh, I'm with the uh, Braxton County uh, Visitor Center and Monster Museum down the way. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I can't believe how many of you are here. Um, it's incredible. I want to introduce to you all um, the, uh, the filmmaker and the man behind Small Town Monsters. I don't know if you guys have looked on the website or looked at you know other uh, features that they've made. It might look like this huge crew, but it's actually a pretty small crew pretty much masterminded by uh, Mr. Seth Freelove. So, Seth, you come out. Um, big thanks to Andrew, not just for helping organize the, this event, but um, also just on the film in general. He was a big part of us being able to make this movie.
We, we make these movies and they very often bring people to the community that have never been here before or might not otherwise have come to the area. So that's, it's, it's a really cool way of introducing people to your community. And I, I know a lot of people don't take these stories seriously and might laugh it off, but this is a very important part of your local history. Whether you think it happened or not is irrelevant. I'm sorry to tell you that. Um, but we think that this is an important piece of, of Flatwoods and Braxton County and the history of this area. So we are very privileged to have been able to tell this story and to have a part in preserving this piece of history uh, of Braxton County and Flatwoods. Um, so I, I, I genuinely thank everyone that was involved in the making of the movie. Thank you for coming and thank you for your supporting. Uh, Braxton County and especially Flatwoods. Thank you most importantly to the Mays um, for their part in this film. There, it wouldn't have happened. It, it really, this movie would not have happened without uh, Ed and Fred May. So a big thanks to them as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming out and uh, thank you for being uh, part of the world premiere of the Flatwoods Monster Legacy of Fear. Did we enjoy the movie overall? I hope if you're from the area, you felt it portrayed the, the people and the community in a positive way um, and sort of uh, enhanced the experience of uh, the, the witnesses that were there that day. So um, I guess I'm going to introduce everyone because this has fallen to me. I'm Seth Breedlove, and I uh, wrote, directed, edited, produced, shot some of the movie. Uh, I did a lot on this one. Um, and I wrote it uh, myself. Normally there's someone co-writing with me, but I very uh, specifically wanted to write this particular movie because I really love this story. I've always wanted to do a movie about the Flywoods monster, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the story in terms of sort of showing how a, a real event can become a legend or myth over time. So that's who I am, the guy that talks a lot. Ashley. Teets, she was in the movie. She told a really fascinating story about her grandma, um, John Gibson. He is the genius behind the Flatwoods Monster Lanterns, which we all know and love. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Dave Spinks, and Dave is in the movie and, and tells a really uh, fascinating story about the Snitowskis. Um, and that was one of my favorite scenes in the movie to film because it was the most ridiculous. Um, and Andrew Smith, Andrew obviously was blabbing earlier, so you guys know him. Um, but these are, th there's no crew with me tonight other than me, but they're, they're, I know Andrew said that it's a very small crew and that is true as far as the crew that films the movie. This movie, I think the biggest crew day we had on this movie was three people, um, but there's, a, there's actually a pretty substantial amount of people that are involved with the making of the movie behind the scenes. Um, production crews, Chris Scalf that did the uh, animated sequences, Santino Vitale who did the uh, stop motion, and Santino's gonna be working more and more with us in the future. We really enjoyed working with him. Um, and there's just, there's a whole crew of people that works on it. The, the music, I have to mention Brandon Dalo who did the music. I really love the music. Uh, in this particular movie. It's probably my favorite score of his. Um, but yeah, there's a whole crew. So we want to take questions from you. You guys don't want to hear me talking about crews over and over. So um, does anyone have questions for myself or any of the other people who are in the film? Yes. Um, if you had someone else to co-write with, do you, how do you think that would change the story? It wouldn't have, because I would not have let them change the story. I, there, so the, the, the approach to the movie was like, if, if we didn't have a hook as far as like a, a storytelling device um, to really ground everything in, in this particular story, I wanted, I, it very specifically opens with the, the over-the-top sort of legend of what people, some people think of the Flatwoods Monster as. Um, and then what the movie that comes after that does is show you what the reality was. Um, so it was always very specifically going to be this. So there's no way I would have let anyone co-write it. I would have let someone fix my writing. I would gladly have someone edit 
my writing, because I, I really, I started in newspaper journalism, and I did that for eight years before I started making movies, but I'm a terrible writer these days, uh, because I just don't do it. So I would have gladly had someone, uh, someone edit my writing, but that didn't happen. That's a good question, though. Thank you for doing a process question. I'm so used to people being like, have you seen The Monster? <laughs> You're about to ask that, aren't you? Have you, have you seen The Monster? <laughs> hey, I have a question for uh, Andrew about the, uh, about the uh, sketch, that original sketch. Uh -huh. uh, can you tell the story about that? Because I always thought that that was, I always kind of wondered what happened to that. And apparently it's like resurfaced just recently. Is that your possession? Or? Well, it, I'll, let me answer your question with another question, then I'll answer it. Right. What made you ask me that? You're holding it in the, in the uh, okay. film. <laughs> okay, I got you. Well, um, and if I was holding it, I probably would let it go. So right, yeah, yeah. Um, well, funny enough is if if anybody would have guessed if that even still existed, the answer would have been no because you can't find anything re regarding this story anymore. Like anything that existed on paper, for some reason, doesn't exist. Like you, you can't you can't find re police reports. Stuff like the, that. The We the People, the We the People television show is is mysteriously gone. I can't tell too much about the story, but like a year ago, I saw a picture, and I was like, no, there's no way that is it. But that has to be it, because there are little details that if you were drawing a reproduction based on like a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox of a newspaper, you would not have fathomed them yet they fit perfectly, and, and I'm an artist. I've, I've been an artist since I was like three years old. So there's just certain things that as soon as I saw them, I thought that there's no way that's not, a, there's no way that's a reproduction. So I immediately contacted the person who posted it and was like, I would, if I were you, I would take that down right now. Um, and then I had a lengthy conversation with them about it and probably scared the crap out of them because, so, so now I can't say anything about who has it but yeah, so that does still exist, and I, I would bet a lot on that. It, there's absolutely no way it's not the real thing, well, and, and it's an honor to see it in the whole thing. Could you suggest to them to make some nice quality prints of that? <laughs> Something I might do in the future is, and it sounds like there might be a market for it, is they were nice enough to let me take some really nice photos of it that you could totally make you know one-to-one -one reproductions of using so that might be something that comes in the future i i can thankfully say this is the one story where i 100 percent believe fred and ed may um in fact i've done interviews lately where people have asked me what the one story or what the one phenomena is that i 100 percent believe in uh as told by the witnesses and this is the only one that i will say outright that i believe in because I, I have no reason to not believe what they're saying. And what's really fascinating about what Ed and Fred say is they're not saying they saw an alien. They're not saying they saw, you know, they're, they're, all they're telling you is they saw something on the hill that night. And I don't believe for a second it was an owl or a tractor or whatever the other, you know, there's a lot of skeptical responses to what they saw. This is the one thing where I can point to and I can say I 100% believe that they they saw what they said they saw. Um, but what that was, I don't know. And Fred, Fred says he doesn't know, so. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, people that I talked to, the, the main person that I remember talking to was Neil Nunley. And um, I kind of wish we'd have got Neil into the into the film because Neil was uh, in high school at the, at the same time I was. We were both freshmen in high school when this happened. And um, uh, Neil was uh, the, the class clown. Uh, he was uh, the kind of guy that had all the teachers treed. I mean, nobody messed with Neil not only. I mean, he would just so quick-witted and so smart and so far ahead of everybody will come to thinking and talking that, you know, he was, uh, he should have been a comedian. And Neil and I were good friends. The one thing that made me believe that he seen something was that he wouldn't talk about 
I mean, we were close, and I'd say, Neil, tell me about the monster, and he'd just, he'd just turn it off. But uh, I probably talked more to Neil about the monster and tried to talk more, and he made me believe more uh, about the monster than anyone else. So at that site that you said where the Flatless Monster was, if you could have, would you have gone back to that site and looked through everything? If I, if I could have, I would have gladly gone up there. Um, you see it more and more these days, like historical landmarks, kind of people buy houses and things, you know, in a location where there's a historical landmark and it becomes a private, you know, a piece of private land and you can't go there anymore. I find things like that a shame. Um, but especially in this case, because it would be so cool to be able to go back up there um, and look around. And I don't, the tree's all rotted and dead now. It's kind of there. The actual really cool part of it is, is I've seen the site um, in elementary school. Of course, I went to Flatwoods Elementary. And our fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Davis, who I think either her mother or her mother-in-law lived on Depot Street. So in the springtime or even in the fall, she would take her class and we would walk up the road and we would go into that field and we saw the tree and we went and she told the story and we sat in the field and it was really cool. I mean, more so now because I can say that I've seen it and just the memory of that really imprinted, you know, the lore and everybody who got to experience it. And I think it's really sad that nobody can do that now. Uh, any, any other questions? Um, what got you interested in making these movies? Uh, yeah. It's it's a really weird career path to take. Like one day you're a, one day you're like a freelance reporter and you're working in medical billing, and the next day you're traveling around the world and country and, and making movies about monsters. Um, I could I, there's no like there's no easy answer. I've always been I've not always, but I've been fascinated by these subjects for a while, and. Um, I just had an idea for a way I would like to see some of these stories told. So I, rather than wait for someone else to do it, I just did it. You know, there there wasn't consistently being good content created, especially in television. Come on, let's be real for a minute. Um, in television, there just wasn't anything being created that spoke to me um, or people that like these subjects uh, but don't. I, I tell I talk a lot about my wife's grandpa uh, George he'll watch uh, some of these shows that they come on TV and he hates them typically <laughs> so I started thinking I should make my movies solely for George like I should try to make a movie for George so that's kind of like my approach is to try to make movies <laughs> yeah um, are there any specific myths about the monster that you would like to clear up like any that you or anything like that? I, th I thought what was really kind of cool that we got to put in the movie, and uh, uh, other people might want to comment on this too, but was uh, the way Fred and Ed were insistent that the dog didn't die. Yeah. Yeah. That is such a, as part of the legend, that has been told from the beginning. Um, you know, like the Ivan Sanderson's interview is all, he talks very adamantly that that dog died and all that. And Ed and Fred are adamant that that dog was around for years after. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool and funny Funny story. That scene was added way late. Um, and the reason was like I couldn't find a good place to really put Ed and Fred sort of refuting that piece of information. And I settled on putting it at the back where they're talking about um, the, the newspaper articles and how those changed everything. Um, but I added it. It was probably the last thing I added to the movie. Um, just because I really wanted to make sure, that, for whatever reason, I really wanted to make sure that people knew that dog lived. Right? <laughs> we, want, we want the dog to live. So how much time did you actually spend, like, research, post-production, from oh. point blank to point blank? So this is actually the longest period of time we've ever spent on a single movie. Um, we've made, this was our sixth, and we typically, the turnaround time is seriously like three to four months. I mean, this was uh, almost a full year. So in terms of research, I was actually researching around, I started researching around the same time last year. Um, and originally this was going to be a 15 to 20 minute YouTube short um, as part of a, a web series I was doing called Case Files. 
um, which you can watch for free if you want to watch. Go to Small Town Monsters YouTube channel and you can watch them. Um, and this was going to be a part of that, but when I was able to get uh, Ed and Fred involved, it became a movie and morphed into something completely different. Um, so it was, it was at least a year. Um, and the, the shooting actually took place over about four different days um, f uh, in different seasons, too. We started, shot first in July, um, and then we shot again in uh, October, which is when I shot Ed and Fred's interview. And then I shot again two days after that. Um, and then I came back and did uh, Dave's interview in January. So I was just here in January um, shooting Dave's interview. The post-production side of it was really difficult. We had to rely on a lot of other artists um, doing, you know, the animated sequences, the illustrations, and um, the CGI Flatwoods monster that shows up during the Snitowski scene. Um, that scene, I mentioned it real quick, but like that scene was an absolute blast to shoot. Um, it was, and when I say an absolute blast, I'm completely lying. It was really miserable. It was cold. We were in a garage. Um, and the green screen I needed, which would have been about 60 feet long, uh, did not work. Um, it just wasn't going to work. So we actually shot that entire scene on a green screen that was only maybe 10 feet long. Um, so we had to very specifically shoot that uh, with an 85 millimeter lens. Oh my gosh, I'm, this is so boring. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it took, it took a year. It took a year. Um, do you believe that the creature is still here on Earth today? Um, in our hearts and minds. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, we don't know what it was, so it's, it's hard to say if it even was a creature. But I, if it was a creature, I hope, he, I hope he is. I hope he's hiding up on that hill waiting to get unsuspecting children. <laughs> yeah. Is it hard to get the witnesses together to do interviews for yeah. your movies? Oh yeah, it's absolutely miserable. No, it's uh, it, 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 and I'm not joking. It really is. Um, it's the reason is is like you're you're in you're basically like thrusting yourself into their lives. Um, in the case of Ed and Fred, they have told this. Well, Ed Ed hadn't, but Fred's told the, his story. Um, he didn't need to tell me his story again. He didn't have a, like a desire to tell me his story again. I basically just bugged him until he said yes. Um, and it took, it took like three months to get him to, 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 to the point where we could schedule, work out the scheduling and everything. So it, it, is a, it is a pain, mostly because I know what a pain I'm being to the, to the witnesses. Um, there's people like Andrew and Dave and John who are like in Ashley who are very giving of their time and like they're fine with it. But I, I do find that witnesses very often are much less um, willing to talk. And then you've got to try to work on them. And 70% of the time, you get nowhere with them. And they never do the interview. And then sometimes you look out and you can interview Ed and Fred May, and it makes your year. One of the things I love so much about this documentary is for the first time, the story of Ashley's grandmother was told. Ashley was kind enough when we first uh, got to know each other. She told me about this, you know, more or less set of three or four sheets of diary paper that her mother had written, or her grandmother had written. Maybe, when would, when would she have actually sat down and typed those out, you think? Maybe in the 80s or before that, even before maybe? Before that. Before? Because I think in them she mentions that she's, she says, I'm a perfectly healthy, mentally stable 30-something. So okay. she was born in 1929. Okay. So it would have been... Right about that time. Okay, and and they they were highly, um, you know, I don't want to say soiled like they were dirty, but you could tell she had touched them a lot, and the their folds were really um, uh, delicate. She so had to be really careful with them. I scanned them and then gave them right back to Ashley. But um, what's what is really terrifying is in the two or three paragraphs that deal with what her grandmother saw, the way that she describes the creature is in a way that it, it sounded like the original eyewitnesses that were, that were more familiar with that took place in you know, 1952, the way they would have told the story. And that's what terrifies me is all these independent stories of people that don't know each other describingly, just describing very eerily similar experiences that you know, just strike you down the bone. 
and she felt compelled to put it on paper too. You know, so it moved her enough. Well, and she even wrote in it. She said, "I can't tell anybody this, but I'm going to write it down because I want a record of it." And you know, she was terrified to talk about. It. She was terrified to tell anybody. We talk about it in the family, but she wouldn't tell anybody else. As far as small town monsters go, um, where you go into towns and there's one creature and you go to another town and there's something similar, have you ever thought about doing a movie that kind of connects like a few small towns together? Ooh, nice, yes. Uh, so in 2019, we are producing a film. We don't have the details locked down yet. I'm actually meeting the filmmaker. He's, uh, his name's Andrew Peterson. And the plan with him is actually to do a bunch of Midwest mysteries um almost like an anthology movie and it would connect all the different towns and that's that's kind of something that i've thought of as well great minds and all that um that's coming in 2019 small town monsters i'm producing it hopefully andrew's directing it when i talk to him next week we still gotta iron out the details but it's coming the other one we wanted to do we always want to do a uh, kentucky movie that would would be like public Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins, a couple of the other like really famous uh, Kentucky legends and tie them together. I don't think that one will ever happen. Unless you to do that, I'll just give them all the stuff I don't have time for. Uh, the Monsters of the Midwest, which we start with the Bray Road Beast, which kicks off probably this fall or winter. Um, and Momo will be coming next. Um, and then one more Midwest monster, and then we're going to kick off the southern monsters with the Bell Witch because we are sick of cryptids and UFOs. So it's time to, time to go into the ghosts. The Momo movie is going to be very uh, grindhouse, 70s, horror infused. I'm very excited to make that movie. I've been wanting to do it for ages. So, hey, thanks for coming out tonight. For real, this was a really unbelievable experience, and thanks so much to, to everyone that was a part of the movie, especially the maze again, and thanks for being so welcoming to us. I'll be at the table. We drove to the highest point we could to do a little bit of UFO searching in the night sky over Braxton County. I brought an EMF meter strapped to an over 5 foot retractable pole. We did some night vision testing using this device. Holding it up in the sky as tall as possible, combined with my own height and taking into consideration our hilltop vantage point, meant that the EMF meter was fairly high in the air. If there was any aerial electromagnetic energy around it, the meter would have picked it up. However, there was no visible phenomenon occurring in the sky at the time, and no EMF spikes to be seen on the device. <laughs> 